Welcome back to our course, Understanding Doctrine, an Introduction to Christian Theology. I'm Pastor Chris Lint from Celebration Community Church in Celebration, Florida. For more information on our ministry, or for any questions that might arise when you're watching these videos, please feel free to email us at info at 44life.com. In our last session, we looked at our unchanging God, three attributes that speak to the fact that our God is sure and constant and stable, not just because he wants to be, but because that is the very nature and essence of our God. He is a unity. He is immutable. He is impassable. In this session, we're going to add two more attributes that sort of fit into this same stream that our God is infinite and eternal. They're part of the package of what we call the simplicity of God. So go back and watch videos 2D and 2E if you skipped over them so that you'll be able to place the content here in the right context. But before I talk about these next two attributes of God, let me kind of pull back to the 30,000 foot level and say a couple of things about God's attributes more generally and how theologians have categorized them over the centuries. First, remember our qualifications about God att God's attributes when we are talking about God's simplicity. Considered in himself as a simple God, God's attributes are identical to his divinity and thus identical to each other. In other words, they are not separable pieces or parts that make up God like parts in a machine. They are all simply who God is in his essence. So distinguishing God's attributes is for our benefit. And this means that it is totally useless and unhelpful to try to come up with a list of more important attributes versus less important attributes. Nor should we try to make one attribute more important than all the others, whether it be God's love or God's sovereignty or God's grace. We shouldn't set one above all of the others in such a way that it diminishes the others. We have to resist these urges. If you'll allow me to use an analogy here, God's attributes are like a single light source shining down through the prism of revelation into human history. And that light is now refracted into what we conceive of as his distinct attributes that are manifested variously at certain times and in certain ways. But in God, they simply are identical to his divine essence, who he is. Next, what are some of the most common ways that theologians categorize God's attributes? And really there are two, uh, two taxonomies that theologians use to kind of classify and group God's attributes. The first one is God's incommunicable versus his communicable attributes. The incommunicable attributes of God are those attributes that are less shared in common with humanity. And the communicable attributes of God are those that are more shared or communicated, shared with humanity. So for instance, God's omnipresence that he can be everywhere at the exact same time. Omnipresence is not a characteristic with which we are familiar with as humans. And so therefore it is a incommunicable attribute of God, but God's mercy is something with which we are familiar because we can exercise mercy. So that would be considered a communicable attribute of God, something that is shared in common with us as humanity. One other common way to categorize God's attributes, and the one that we're going to use in this course, is to differentiate between his absolute attributes, that is those characteristics that belong to God's essence without respect to humanity, and his relative attributes, that is those qualities in God that have some relation to us as creatures or that are more clearly seen by virtue of the relationship between us and God. So far in this course, we've only covered some of God's absolute attributes. We still have a few more to go, including in this video, and we haven't really talked about any of God's relative attributes, but we'll get there. But so far, we've covered God's simplicity, his unity, 
his immutability and his impassibility. And all of those are what we would call absolute attributes of God. So putting all of this together, listen carefully to this quote by Stephen Doobie, professor at Grand Canyon University. And I ran out of room to put Stephen's picture up here, so sorry, Stephen. But here's what he says, and this is so good and is so helpful and is so precise. So listen carefully to this. The absolute attributes belong to God from eternity and without respect to creatures, while the relative belong to God in time with some relation toward creatures. The former, that is the absolute attributes, are identical to God's essence considered absolutely, though still under diverse aspects, while the latter, God's relative attributes, are also identical to God's essence, considered in relation to the creature under some aspect of creaturely circumstance. God, this part is important, God does not undergo change so as to accrue the relative attributes. In, order, in other words, these relative attributes, God's love, his mercy, his benevolence, his grace, things that we share in common with him, God doesn't acquire them at some point in his existence. He has always been these things, just as he has always been immutable and impassable and simple. God does not undergo change so as to accrue the relative attributes. Rather, the creature, we as humans, we undergo change, taking up a new relation to God and thus meeting the same divine essence in new ways. So this is a helpful way to think about the, the attributes of God, his absolute and his relative attributes. So, with that classification now in mind, let's turn to two more of God's absolute attributes, two that are very closely related to each other. The first is that God is infinite. God is infinite. Infinity speaks to the immensity of God and his absolute perfection. In fact, to say that God is infinite means that no higher degree of perfection can be added to God. It's the word that we use to describe his fullness of being in every way. Our God is unlimited and unlimitable. And because of our doctrine of divine simplicity, all his attributes are identical with each other, which means that all of his attributes are infinite. He is infinitely holy. There's no higher degree of holiness that God can attain, and we can't begin to measure his holiness. In the same way, God is infinitely loving, and he is infinitely merciful, and he is infinitely gracious, and infinitely wise, and kind, and good, and just, and righteous. All of those to the absolute total peak of perfection, if that could even be measured. In fact, we can't even measure it. That's what it means for him to be infinite. And the inference drawn from all of this is that God is completely transcendent beyond all creation. Here are a few scriptures that speak to this attribute. And they do so even when the actual word infinite isn't used. Don't make the mistake of thinking that we can only go to where the word is used to talk about a specific attribute or a sp specific truth in Scripture. Sometimes we have to look for the concepts. But here are a few of them. Psalm 148, verse 13. Praise the name of Yahweh, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above heaven and earth. So here we get this uh, idea that God is unlimited. He's beyond the scope of imagination. 1 Kings verse 8, I mean chapter 8, verse 27. Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. So here's this idea of God being infinite. Heaven and even the highest heaven cannot contain him. How much less this house that I have built. This is where King Solomon has dedicated the temple to the Lord, but he recognizes that God doesn't dwell in temples made by human hands. Indeed, the highest heaven cannot contain him. He is that immense. Job 
chapter 11, verse 7. Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? And again, these are rhetorical questions, and the answer is no. No one can know the limit of who God is. In all that he is, he is without limit and unlimitable. And then Revelation chapter 21, verse 6. God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Now, this verse is really important. It teaches us that God is not in process. He's not moving from Alpha to Omega. The verse doesn't say that God is Alpha and beginning. It says at the same time that he is Alpha and Omega, he is beginning and end. He simply is. And his fullness, his infinite fullness, pervades all of reality. But this verse also touches on our next attribute, that of eternity. God is eternal. This means that his existence is not measured in increments of succession. In, in, indeed, God is measured by nothing other than himself. He is a timeless God, atemporal in his essence. He transcends time and he pervades all time simultaneously, such that it is not proper really to speak of a past or a future for God. God is eternally present, eternally now. Yet, in the same breath, we must also acknowledge that God reveals his unchanging nature to his creation and he unfolds his eternal purposes for us in time and space. But he, as a simple God who is spirit, is no way bound by the same sorts of successions and measurements of time as we are. Some key texts for God's eternality, Psalm 90, verse 2, which says this, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Isaiah, chapter 57, verse 15 Thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. This verse is so sweet because it tells us that even though God is beyond time, he's atemporal in his existence, nevertheless, he invades and pervades all of time so that he can be a personal God, a God who is both transcendent but also close to us. Now, this attribute of eternity is just as hard to talk about as it is to comprehend because it can't be adequately described using time-bound terminology, which is all that we have to try to describe the fact that God is eternal. God's experience of time, if you will, is so totally different from ours. But how absolutely amazing that he chooses to act and reveal himself in time so that we may know him. When you think about some of the major acts of God that take place in time, like creation or redemption, how do those historical acts fit with the fact that God himself is unchanging and eternal. Well, Christian theology has always stated that God is the eternal creator and redeemer. Even though from our vantage point, those acts had a beginning point in time, they nevertheless manifest an absolute reality in God. It's not something that God came to be. He didn't become creator or redeemer at some point in time. That would go against the fact that God is immutable, that he is unchangeable. Rather, our God is the sword of God who creates and redeems, and that has always been true of his very essence. His eternal nature produces temporal effects from a creaturely perspective. 
We come to know and call him creator and redeemer in time, but he is the eternal creator and redeemer. I leave you in this session with a challenge and a practical question kind of mixed together. Make a list of all of the ways that you are limited by or affected by time. And then for everything that you put on that list, I want you to go one by one and consider that God is not so limited. And then answer this question. How does that deepen your love and your trust in God?